<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is podcast industry veteran, strategist, and CEO and co-founder of JAR Audio, Roger Nairn. Roger is a lateral thinker, problem solver, strategist, and finder of new ways. He believes in the power of the happy customer and spent many years managing client relationships and building brands for some of the biggest and most influential companies in the world through his experience at global advertising giants like DDB and Cosette. However, after an opportunity presented itself to offer podcasting as a service, Roger and his founding partners leapt at the chance to make it happen, and boy did they. That event led to the founding of an agency, JAR Audio, whose specific focus is on helping companies to leverage podcasting to expand their brand and generate new revenue. Joining us today for an exciting conversation about why brands should be embracing podcasting, what you need to know to make your podcast stand out, the state of the podcasting industry today and what we can expect in the future, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, CEO and co-founder of JAR Audio, Roger Nairn. Hey, Roger. How are you, man? Fantastic, guys. How are you doing? So good. Thanks so much for making the time to do this and uh, all the way from the great white North. Exactly. Yeah. Not too, not too great. I mean, we're close, (laughs) pretty close to Seattle. Yeah. No, actually Vancouver is one of my favorite cities. I've been there several (laughs) times and uh, I I quite enjoy it there. So uh, awesome. Awesome. It's it's really sad because I'm from Seattle and I've only been there once when I was like 10. Oh, really? I I need to make the trip back up. Yeah. You got to come back up, come, come back up for sure. It's beautiful (laughs) up here. And I was going to say, what's worse is you, you spent so many years, Mike and Anacortes. And I mean, that's like half the way, like you're practically there. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No excuse. I love Anacortes too. It's beautiful there. Oh, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Any chance I get, I'll go back there. So. And Ryan, you're from Salt. You're from Salt Lake. Yeah, well, I'm based in Salt Lake. I'll based never Salt Lake. being, you know, a Utah, but I am from or living. Here. I think I think the uh, the the lifestyle here and the the uh, the environment here is very very similar to Salt Lake mountains yeah, and true. and a lot of outdoor fun. Yeah, lots of outdoor stuff, all that all that kind of thing. We got the same totally. weather, similar weather. We're a little drier than you guys, but yeah. That. This is such a Canadian thing. We're talking about the weather already. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just shows my age. I, I've noticed in the last few years, I've started becoming the real, you know, get off my yard guy. Yeah. So, and uh, and this is a big part of that, right? Is I just revert right to weather. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, uh, how you got started in the industry and, and what led you to podcasts. Yeah, for sure. So born and raised in Vancouver, um, just a little little town outside of Vancouver, um, went to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do in school, to be honest. I, I got my BA in sociology. I uh, bounced around from class to class, not really having a, a purpose or direction. Got out of school and um, had, a, had a mentor tell me that I, I needed to learn how to sell. Uh, it didn't matter what I was going to do in life. You know, Selling is a good skill. So I, I did my research, found that the best company to teach me selling was uh, Xerox. For those that uh, remember companies like Xerox, photocopier, scanners, they also had the most incredible sales program. So I, I got a job with them, went and uh, did about a month and a half of like incredibly intense sales training. It was some of the best training I've ever received. Had nothing to do with photocopiers. It was just about you know solution-based selling. Went to work for Xerox, absolutely hated it. I, I, I loved dealing with people. I loved the idea of selling. I didn't like going door-to-door selling you know, hundred thousand dollar copiers. Um, had another mentor who said to me, "You know, you're such a creative guy, and you also love to sell. Have you ever thought about advertising? Advertising is the rock star of the business world. And I mean, how could you not turn down at least exploring that? So I started to explore further. Decided I was going to quit my job at Xerox, go back to school. I got my um, marketing certificate from a, a local college here, and that's where it all started. I. I I've been in the um, in the marketing and advertising world for uh, 20 plus years now. Started as an intern with a small agency, worked my way up in client services at uh, DDB, one of uh, the world's most recognized advertising agencies. Was with them for many, many, many years. Um, started with uh, with other agencies after that, and um, I, I just absolutely love it. I, I love the people. I love the, the the thinking that goes behind it and the creativity that goes into it. I started getting into the podcast game just as a uh, a, a hobby. I um, I wanted to use it as an excuse to meet really incredible people, and and I did. I, I you know I had a few podcasts of my own that I was just playing around with. Gave me an excuse to reach out to some of my favorite authors and and writers and and designers. Um, you know had had a few of those, 
And then um, met a few people uh, and we, we started talking and, and, and discussed what it would be like to take all of our individual skills, put it together and get into the podcast industry and, and see if we can really make something of it. And that's how our company, Jar Audio, was born. It started out with a couple of beers one night. Um, we talked about my partner who came from the journalism space, I who came from the advertising space, and our third partner who came from the audio and, and tech space. We said, what if we combined those and um, serviced brands and businesses that were trying to get into the podcast space? Literally went home that night, um, put out, I think it was eight messages on LinkedIn to just individual people as a bit of a test, Saw it, you know, just to see if there's any interest. The second person I sent a note to responded by saying, my wife is looking for this exact service. Can you be in her office on Thursday? We were in their offices on Thursday and it turned into our very first ever client. And it literally rolled from there. Nice. Yeah. No, yeah, I, wish no, it was I just love that. For us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, think I just we, love that. I think and, we got started over a couple of beers too. I, I mean, <laughs> for sure. Well, what's funny too, though, is the direction that we went. So, so my background also is in marketing and advertising. Mike's background is in music and, and, and production, right? So he was able to capture our voice and record it and edit it. I was yeah. able to market it and promote it and all that stuff. So we did sort of what you guys did. However, we stopped at doing it for ourselves. So I think the idea of you guys doing it is really a, an interesting idea because basically for me, I guess I was the brand, right? I, I mean, we were, we were able to put this thing together ourselves, uh, you know, unlike your clients probably in most cases, but ultimately we were sort of what you do, right? We were the brand that you guys would do work for. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about just sort of I guess the business of podcasting, right? Because I mean, you guys have been at this a few years and obviously for people, you know, even if you're just sort of, I don't know, tangentially paying attention to the podcasting industry, you like it, it's grown a ton in the last few years. It's obviously growing more and more each year. It's becoming, you know, the way people consume content. And I wonder if you talk about just sort of the transition from the early days of trying to pitch this thing. You know, you mentioned you ran into an opportunity where somebody was looking for it, but in your clients, generally speaking, or as you're looking for people, like how do they even know they need this? Yeah, that's a great question. When we first started, the conversation was, um, have you thought about, you know, kind of playing around the podcast space? Um, you know, those, those brands that were interested in it were expecting it to be, you know, sort of Joe Rogan level audience size. Um, they wanted to create something that was, you know, going to revolutionize the podcast space and, 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 and some have, but, but also, some haven't. And, and the reason for that is, is um, you just, you know, the opportunity to, to appeal to a niche audience. And, and so right now our phone is ringing off the hook. The podcast space has grown exponentially um, all throughout COVID, but, but even, you know, and, and even sort of today. Um, so brands are seeing it as an opportunity to have, you know, engaging conversations with, with a specific audience. It could have mass appeal, or could could be very much, you know, um, um, aimed at a specific niche audience. Gives them a, a, an engagement opportunity that is unlike anything else, um, and it really gives them a good opportunity for for storytelling. So, we've been a part of that of helping them see that that sort of education side of things. I, I would say the first sort of two years, it was like all in on education, talking about things like what to expect from an audience size to engagement level, to downloads, to uh, you know how many episodes you should produce, um, explaining to them sort of where the costs come from and, and kind of the nuts and bolts side of, of that. But now they're seeing, they're, they've even done it, they, they've either done it already or they're seeing more of that sort of industry knowledge uh, and, and are coming to us with a little bit more of an idea of exactly what they want and how they want it. And we're having that conversation from a sort of agency client perspective on how we can work together. Yeah. So, well, and that was, I think kind of what I wanted to dig into is that education bit, right? Because I think, like you said, everybody comes into it with this expectation that they're going to be the next Joe Rogan and they're going to be yeah. speaking to a million dollars, you know, a million people. And I noticed one of the examples on your website was the American express podcast. <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, who listens to the American Express podcast, right? So, I mean, it's like, you know, so, I mean, what is that? I guess when, you, when you're when you going to work with a client like that, or you're trying to convince them that this is worth something, mm -hmm. even knowing that they probably aren't going to have a massive audience, and they might, maybe they'll hit, you know, hit the ball out of the park with the right interview or some great content or who knows. 
Totally. But generally speaking, you know, if if you're as a company going into creating a podcast sort of about your business, mm-hmm. you know, how do you sort of, I guess, hedge the expectations and, and keep people, I guess, I guess, thinking realistically, right? I mean, because yeah. this does need to be an entertainment project, not just a commercial probably. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I wonder how you sort of coach them through that process. Yeah. So 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 the first thing is, is, it, it, is the podcast can't be about their business it, and it won't be about their business. We won't work with them if it's about their business because nobody wants to listen to a 20 or 30 minute ad. It's just not going to happen. However, Every brand has a st- either either a, a story to tell that is you know somewhat tangential to the brand and their values. They've got value to deliver in in you know could be certain amount of knowledge on a topic. It could be um, access to a certain amount of you know research or, or insights. And so, what our job is is to uncover kind of like what are some of the things that you know your audience would be interested in. We always focus on the audience. The audience is the number one thing, you know, just like any other form of content. So we get a real good understanding of like, who is that audience? What do they need? You know, your brand aside, like what do they need in life? And, 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 and then understanding what they need, can your brand deliver that in the form of a podcast? So you just mentioned, um, you know, American Express. So with American Express, it's not about American Express. It's about small business ownership and the struggles and trials and tribulations of owning a small business. Their audience, that audience is small business owners. It happens to be Canadian small business owners, but we do work globally and you know, it just happened in that case, it's very specific. So our audience is small business owners. The podcast is all about how to make it through you know, the, the small business world. And so every episode is on topics like cash flow. Or building a brand, or you know, making sure that you're considering all the you know diversity and inclusion um, sort of uh, you know things that you need to be considering as a, as a business these days. And so, everything is delivered from the standpoint of how can we, you know, help our audience make their lives easier. You know, but also like helping can be everything from like giving them a laugh making them cry if they need, you're not making them cry, but, you know, t- tugging on an emotional, uh, you know, uh, uh, on some of the emotions um, or just giving them a great story to, to listen to. So it's not about the brand. It's not about the, um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the products they sell and things like that. Cause nobody wants to listen to that. Um, now is the brand, is the brand mentioned for sure. You know, it's, it's um, typically mentioned off the top, mentioned off the tail, We'll do a, you know, kind of a midpoint rebrand. You know, you're listening to Business Class Build It Braver, a podcast by American Express, you know, things like that. So the brand is acknowledged. It's coming from the brand. But we also try to make it so that the audience sees the brand as the sort of deliverer of this great, uh, this great value and knowledge. And so that's, you know, and we can tell when we've done that because the audience, uh, the audience grows. Yeah. Well, and to your point, like with a company like American Express specifically, I don't know what Canadian marketing looks like for them, but here in the States, they do a lot of advertising around small mm-hmm. businesses and support small businesses. And they always do, you know, small business day uh, marketing and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? So I guess to your point, this idea is they were tangentially tied to small business anyway, mm-hmm. even though ultimately they provide credit or, or debt for people, mm-hmm. they actually do you know, through their marketing uh, messaging, they they Mm -hmm. actually do support a small business. So it makes sense for them to speak as an expert in small business. Yeah. I mean, another example is Expedia. We did, we we did a podcast with them called out travel the system. Um, It wasn't about Expedia deals. It wasn't about getting the, you know, the, the, the best discount on your, your flights and whatnot. Instead, it was, it was helping you sort of navigate the online travel space and getting the most out of your travel, you know, kind of nowhere, no matter where you purchase it from. Um, it just happened to be brought to you by Expedia. Now we would fold in different, you know, every once in a while we would fold in sort of different Expedia knowledge, you know, subject matter experts because there there's no better company in the world when it comes to travel data, for example. And you know, in the middle of COVID, um, people needed a good understanding of sort of like what are the new rules and regulations? What are, and then, you know, Expedia sees that on a global level. And so, you know, to be able to deliver that info was, was, was hugely valuable. So um, I was wondering if we could take a step back uh, mm-hmm. to your first client, the, the person you reached out, she said, get us, you're in her office on Thursday. You got two days and now you got to come up with what do we do? Right. How do we do it? What do we sell to them? 
And we, Ryan and I have been down this road. We actually owned a, a recording studio in Salt Lake for podcasting. And we, we tried to put package materials together. And we had a really hard time justifying the expense to the client. No one wanted to pay for, you know, studio time, for production time, for this, for that. And then let alone figuring out what to charge. So I, I think with your background in the advertising industry and working with such a big, big clients, you know, that's less of a headache on your end, but on our, on our end, it was hard to get, you know, mom. Oh, it was mom. still a headache. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, I'm sure they had a little bit bigger, bigger budgets to work with and right. you justify the expense a little more, but uh, mm -hmm. can you maybe talk about putting your pitch deck together, what mm -hmm. services you, you provided and um, you know, how it went the first few times? Yeah. So, so my, the, the mindset I, so I came from client service and, and you, you know, in an agency world, client service is, is nice because you're kind of in the middle of everything. You, you know, you're, you're not the writer, you're not the art director, you're not the media buyer, you, you know, you're not the strategist. You're kind of like the, the quarterback in a lot of ways. You're, you're, you're the, you're the pivot. You know, <laughs> we used to always say we're the neck that turns the head, you know? Um, so yeah, say, I, I spoke I, like a true account guy, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As I said that, I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, and so, and so I wanted to build the agency. And when I say I, it, it became me, it, sorry, it became us uh, from a team, but uh, my partners didn't know that about what, how an agency is structured. I wanted to structure our offering exactly like a creative agency. You know, you've got a client service lead, you've got a strategist, you've got your creatives. In our case, they're producers and audio technicians and and uh, you know music composers, and um, we've got project leads or what we you know, project managers on every project. We've got you know kind of the the media supplier side of things, and so if we could offer sort of that full service, to me, these big brands would understand and speak that language and would be able to easily sort of insert us into their content marketing mix. And so that's how we described it from day one is, you know, think of us like your creative partner, only we just make podcasts and, and that stuck today. And, but, but as far as like the nuts and bolts of like pricing and stuff like that, that very first meeting, I'll never forget, had a good conversation about sort of what the podcast might be and who the audience was. <laughs> they looked at us and said, great, send us an estimate. And we went, okay, okay. Sounds good. Ha, had no pricing. We didn't think about pricing at all. Um, I'll be honest, you know, and this is just part of being a small business owner is I kind of went like this and just felt like, I feel like this amount is right for this service. I didn't really know if that was right or not. I honestly didn't even do the calculation on it. We just threw that number out and, uh, and it worked for them. And, 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 and that's kind of, slowly just it being iterated as we've gone about our business. And, and we're now at the point where we're, you know, counting hours and you're counting the minutes and hours of, of all of our teammates and, you know, projects. And we're, we're getting a good understanding of sort of where the profitability lies. What's a, what's a profitable client? What isn't um, how we need to sort of sell ourselves and our services, how that fact, you know, obviously that, that factors into pricing, but so, from, um, from the very beginning, it was very iterative. So, what services did you provide them? Are you doing everything? Yeah. Are you writing content? Are you totally finding guests? Are you doing all that stuff? Are you just kind of facilitating the studio and the editing and all that stuff? Yeah, it's a great question. So we offer full service, um, but are flexible. We understand that there are, you know, floors of content folks at some of these companies that obviously know how to write and, and, and whatnot. So it depends on the client. It depends on the scenario, but most, for the most part, we're full, we're full service. So we'll do everything from the strategy. We'll find uh, strategy, um, developing the concept, um, finding the right host for the show, and doing all the um, contracting of that host, all the legal side of that. We're putting together an entire season arc. So let's say we're doing twelve episodes. We need to understand who are those guests going to be for the episodes. We're then finding those guests doing the you know do, you know hitting the pavement making the phone calls trying to nail down who's going to be the right guest for these episodes contracting them getting them on board we do pre-interviews of every single one of our uh, of our guests um it, it's a lot of work but it it, it it results in a better product because it gives us an understanding of what are the right questions that our host needs to be asking in the interview or or perhaps things that we should avoid because they kind of go off on tangents about, but it's not really interesting for the listener. Um, we also get a good understanding of 
are these guys going to be a dud as far as an interview goes? You know, you, you, there's a lot of incredibly smart people out there, but not the best at sort of explaining what they do or how they do it. And so it gives us an opportunity to go to the client and say, this guy is just not going to be right for the episode. It's, it's not going to work. And so we'll, we'll cut that off and find somebody else. So we're finding all the, the, you know, we're doing the host, we're doing the guests. We're then doing all of the, um, uh, the, 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 the recording of the interview. So we do everything remote. Um, not everything, but 95% remote. Uh, we've developed an incredible system where we're shipping equipment all around the world. We're, coordinating with our hosts and guests to find the absolute optimal recording space within their house or office or wherever we need to be. Um, and then we're recording uh, remotely uh, using a number of different pieces of software. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then um, all the edits, you know, um, take, taking uh, all the bits and pieces and, and producing the, the spot, uh, custom music if we need to, or finding the right the right needle drop. Um, so producing the episode and then we have a full marketing team as well that, that establishes and grows our, <clears throat> our show audiences. And so their job is to do everything from developing the artwork to creating the landing page or integrating with the client's web team on how to, you know, create a space on their website for the podcast, doing all the um, distribution. So hosting a distribution, and then we'll do everything from, PR and publicity to paid media to content creation and writing. But again, everything is unique. Everything is bespoke and it all depends on sort of what the client can lean in on, what we can lean on, lean in on. And, and we, so it's very collaborative and, and, and a, kind of a back and forth. Yeah. Like that. So just so people know, I, I really appreciate you taking the moment to sort of, pull, I guess, pull back the curtain on this sort of thing, because I'm, a, I'm fascinated with the development of these companies early on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you mentioned that you were sort of just, you know, I don't know, for lack of a better term, just sort of pulling the pricing out of your butt, you know, for that mm -hmm. first one, like basically every small business person does ever, right? If you don't have like a widget that you can just mark up a percentage or something. And, and, and not to cut you off, but also there weren't, there, there aren't, at the time, there are not a lot of companies that do what we do. So I couldn't go on a blog and say, or, you know, I couldn't listen to a podcast episode on somebody explaining how to start a podcast production agency for brands and say, okay, that's sort of how they price things out. So we kind of had to make it up because we were sort of yeah. starting well, and, from scratch. And so much about pricing creative services is that, right? I mean, and, and like you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of your gut or you could sort of, you know, take the temperature and see where things were that, that is no doubt experience from your agency career, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> at this point, you know, if I'm selling podcasts through our agency, I, I would certainly know, or like have a ballpark of where to start, right? It may not be accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll do the math later, just like you described, but, but um, and I'm also, I'm also a big are, believer in, in, you know, the, the, the market will tell you what it is willing to pay or not pay. And you, you, you know, the, that that's not a condemnation of your pricing. It's just feedback. And you take that feedback and you, you work with it and, 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 and fix, you know, whatever yeah. needs to be fixed and move on to the next thing. And, and uh, you get, you get into a bit of a, a groove. Yeah. I think the interesting part is when you get told we're charging too little, <laughs> that's that. And that's, you know, that happened as well, to be honest, you know, some of these brands we'd work with had worked with kind of other type companies, not totally similar to ours, but they were charging, way more than us. And so we kind of, that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, you know, were we leaving money on the table or were we comfortable being where we were and, and use that as an advantage. And so that became a, a conversation as well. Well, and so I think one of the things I wanted to maybe showcase too, while you're, you know, guessing at pricing and things like that, I mean, certainly you couldn't offer this whole suite of services at the jump either. Like, so was there a, P well, I mean, I guess, you know, through the expertise yeah. of your team, you guys could probably cover a lot of ground, but, um, mm -hmm. But did you guys experience like kind of a moment of, I guess, problem solving on the fly, I guess. I mean, part of what I'm trying to showcase here is for the young entrepreneur, the, yeah. you know, the fact that you don't necessarily have to have all the answers, you know, sort of put yourself out there, don't be held back by fear or whatever, and then share this. And mm -hmm. there's a reason I'm, I'm asking this. So it, go ahead and, and tell me what you think about that. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's definitely a level of like fake it till you make it. And I do think that that's incredibly valuable and important when you're building a business, but then also there's the like humility of being able to say, to a client, we've never done this before. And also nobody else has. <laughs> and so, and, and as long as there's that mutual understanding that this is something you want and see value in, let's figure it out together. 
and most, you know, most of the time they're totally willing to, to be flexible in, 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 you know, in that, I think it's when you like totally promise something that you never really intended to ever be able to properly deliver. That's where things get really sticky. And again, you know, the fake it till you make it is, is, is great, but also there, there needs, you need to be faking something that is in the back of your mind. You got to plan for how you're going to deliver on it. Um, you know, you might not have all those pieces yet. You might have to find contractors. You might have to jump on Fiverr and, and kind of, you know, uh, they don't see all the, you know, it's like the duck, the calm duck on the, on the lake. You don't see the, you know, the kicking feet under yeah. the water. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I, I think a lot of it comes down to communication. Yeah. Well, and what I like about that, or the reason I'm trying to showcase this is I think in this generation of sort of young entrepreneurs, people coming up, you know, they, they tune to YouTube, they listen to podcasts, they do whatever. Right. And it seems that everybody is hustle, an hustle porn. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it seems like everybody's got it all figured out and look at me and the way I'm presenting myself on this podcast. Like, you know, I'm all polished and I know what I'm talking about and all this stuff. Right. And we've had a number of people come on the show and tell us this, right. That, that basically they're a 10 year overnight success, right. All yeah. you see is the end result. You don't see all the work going up to it. Yeah. And the reason I'm talking about all this is so I, I listened to another interview that you did on a show called three, six, five or, or founders, three, six, five. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned this uh, business idea that you had for starting a, a dress t-shirt company or a dress shirt yeah. that was probably <laughs> a little premature at the time. Nowadays, God, you'd be a billionaire. But um, <laughs> so, but why, why I wanted to bring it up is you mentioned sp- something specific, which was that you spent a lot of time looking at the brand and trying to come up with a name and trying to come up with all the different pieces and parts, the identity, all these things. And it felt like you were doing something, but in reality, you were kind of doing nothing in terms of pushing mm-hmm. the business forward, right? And as a as maybe an art guy or as a, an agency guy, this is my approach too, right? I'm constantly mm-hmm. thrashing on the new cool thing and check out this new logo and check out this new website and all this stuff, but I never do the, the market research or I never actually pull the trigger and fire to an audience. Yet you did that with Jar Audio. And so I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about just sort of your experience as an entrepreneur, but then what you did differently to sort of break through that barrier, because I think it's a really common one for people. Yeah, no, that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, first of all, I, I read the, I read the book, the war, the war of art, um, which is Good by one. Stephen Pressfield, which I'm sure you're listening. Many of your listeners have, have probably heard of, but for those that don't know it, it, it talks about kind of the, the, um, the, the, the mental side of being an artist and you can apply artists to any number of things. I mean, as a business owner and, and builder, I consider myself an artist. My art is my business, you know? Um, and so one of the things he talked about was just, you know, the, you're not doing it until you're doing it. You, you know, you're not creating art until you ship that art and you're not really an artist until you're actually doing, you know, building and, and creating. And so, I very, I very consciously said to myself and my partners, which, you know, was it literally in that bar when we were having a drink, I said, I'm not going to do this until we can put the sort of minimum viable product out in the world and just kind of build from there. I don't want to get days later. You're yeah. Two days, <laughs> two days, honestly, guys, two days later, we, we were in their office and I'm not, it just sounds like a crazy story, but it's true. We didn't even have a name. The name jar audio stands for Jen, Aaron and Roger. And as a marketing guy, I'm super embarrassed by that because <laughs> it's an acronym and we all know that acronyms are a bit cringy, but like, that's literally how thrown together this thing was because we were just going to kind of like, let's make sure that the service is something that people need first. <laughs> and then we'll worry about the website. We'll worry about the, I made the logo, the, our very first logo on Canva. It was like a templated thing. I threw it together on a Squarespace site and I put some copy on there and it stayed that way for like a year or something. Um, but it worked and it just was you know, enough that people needed, but like the name jar audio is, thrown together because somebody, they asked us what our name was. And we said, uh, uh, my partner at the time, Aaron said, uh, what about jar audio? Then Stanford, Jen and Roger. And okay, fine. And it stuck. I, I, I wouldn't get me too bad critical. about that because our, our podcast is called eggs. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, um, I can't be too critical either. Cause my 15 year old ad agency is called R2 media group, which is just Ryan Rogar. That's me. So, <laughs> so, so maybe, we, maybe we, we should be much more open about this. Cause I remember growing up in the ad world and this was like a, 
cringy no-no. So maybe we should all just be, well, and we you should know what's make it really funny too is so I had begun life as just Ryan Rogar, independent graphic designer, right? I was just a freelancer. Yeah. And, uh, it, I had this thing occur to me, you know, kind of in the spirit of fake it till you make it. I yeah. had this thought that was like, well, what do agencies sound like? Right. Like, I mean, I don't sound like oh. an agency. I sound like a guy, you know? So yeah. if I want to do agency work, I have to sound like an agency. So what might that sound like? Media group. Of course, totally. obviously, yeah. right? And I mean, I, we don't buy media. We never bought media. publicists, oh, Omnicom, like they are, right. they're all big media groups. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no. So it, it, so anyway, so it's just funny because, you know, it is sort of that, that thing. But I, I do think it is cool to be a little bit transparent about that, right? Because for people who don't know or who people are starting a business, you know, they might feel stupid and that might be the reason that keeps them from entering the market anyway. Totally. You know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that like, you know, there are, there are businesses, certain types of businesses where you want to have a little bit more planning in place because you're going to be throwing some capital at it. Uh, you know, but then there are the sort of the service-based and kind of professional uh, services type jobs where it's just you and your expertise and your knowledge. I think those are the ones that are a little bit easier to just kind of like test the waters, put it out there, see what happens you, and, and then be okay with the feedback you get because that's part of the building is that feedback and it's not them it's not any sort of condemnation of your idea it's just it's just it's good feedback um it uh it ser it served us well and and um i'm glad that we kind of went that route because at the same time but okay so i the one thing i i haven't ever explained to somebody though is that um you grow you grow you grow you get big we're also up against an industry that is relatively new. You know, it's really only been around for about 15 years. The definitely the branded podcast side is about five years, six years old. Um, and so you build, you build, you build, but you're constantly asking yourself, like, is this just an anomaly? Are we because because it it becomes successful and you, you know. We're now at, you know, we started as three partners off the side of our desks and we're now a team of, you know, 18 full-time employees and 45 contractors that are practically our employees all around the world. And, and so you kind of build, 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 and you're kind of going like, all right, well, this, this sort of iteration, slowly building thing just kind of keeps going, doesn't it? It's not stopping. It's not stopping. It's not stopping. And at no point have I ever actually stopped thinking that we're just kind of building as we go. It's actually never stopped. I've never once thought this is now a total thing now. And we're like, never going to not be a thing. It's always just like, okay, how can we kind of slowly build, 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 build. And I think that that sort of um, Stephen Pressfield kind of Warren art mindset for me has never gone away. Yeah. And I think that, you know, especially in the tech space, uh, this idea of sort of perpetual building is something that I think is really common. But I mean, mm -hmm. short of, well, and maybe even if you step into a giant corporation as CEO of an established company, I mean, ultimately it's still build, right? So, but I think that again, in just sort of the spirit of transparency for for entrepreneurs, that is, I think, an a, a, a insight that not everybody talks about. This idea that, you know, there really isn't a finish line, right? The journey is the thing, as cliche as that sounds. Yeah. And yeah. so, but it really is all about, you know, taking the steps and putting one foot in front of the other. Like, that's where you should be deriving your joy. It's not really about, you know, getting to the top of the mountain. It's kind of like the the realization that, like, the the problems and the anxiety around those problems and the sort of the fires that need to be put out, that's never going to change either. Like it's just part of owning a business is that everyone eventually ladders up to you and, and being the CEO that, that, you know, that's sort of more prevalent than, than, than anybody else on our team. Um, so it, there's sort of like, you come to this kind of Zen like quality of like, that's just part of the job and this is never going to go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, I was wondering if we could maybe revert back to podcasting. For sure. Um, can we talk about your production process, how you work with remote uh, talent and getting the final product put together? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an in-house team or is most of your editing and, and production um, through uh, like contractors? Yeah. So we, we have an in-house leadership team who find and manage those partners or those, those, those contractors. And so, Go, you know, going back to the spirit of sort of the bespoke nature of what we do, we made a concerted effort not to hire too quickly, you know, kind of like 
in-house concrete teams because we didn't want to establish like a house style. We don't want a house style because it's again, all about the listener and it's all about the brands and they have their sort of brand tone that we need to slot ourselves into similar to, again, you know, a creative agency doesn't have a a house or shouldn't have a real house style either because it's all about the brands they work with. And so we have a, a, you know, we have leader, you know, leadership in uh, project management, uh, um, delivery or, or, you know, kind of our, our creative products, uh, sorry, our, our, um, our audio. So we've got a, a director of, of a technical director who's responsible for all of our sound. And then uh, an executive producer who's disp- who's responsible for all of our storytelling. Um, and then we have a marketing lead who's responsible for the marketing side. And then based on the project, we'll find the right contractors and build the, the team accordingly. The thing to also remember is that we want to match up the right, you know, creative with the right subject matter. So, you know, t- talking earlier about, uh, uh, okay, you know, one of what, an example is um, the uh, RBC uh, Disruptors pod- podcast that we do. RBC is one of the largest banks in Canada, but also has a presence in the United States. We do an incredibly popular show um, called Disruptors. Our our producers that we've assigned to that show have a bit of a economics background and an understanding of uh, the show is actually not about banking. It's about, you know, disruptive technology and sort of rethinking the Canadian economy. And so they have a, an understanding of like the tech world and innovation. And so we'll match up the right creative with the right project and, and sort of build it that way versus we've got these bodies sitting around. Let's make sure they're always busy, you know, slot them in to a project and, and resource that way. So uh, we, you know, we, we, we assign according to the, you know, to the needs of the, of, of the project, but yeah, so we, we work with um, audio technicians uh, and recordists. Sometimes they can be the same person. Sometimes, sometimes they can be different. We'll have a producer on every project. A producer is responsible for everything from writing the scripts to researching the guests to, uh, you know, uh, all the coordination of, of um, how the, you know, how the edit goes They'll work with an audio technician. Like I said, like I said, we'll have an audio te- technician on the project. Every project also has a project lead who's like a, a coordinator responsible for timelines, coordinating with our team and the client team. Uh, depending on the size of the, the project, we'll have a, a, a chase producer who's responsible for finding and nailing down the guests or the, the host as well. Um, and then we'll have on the marketing side, usually um, a marketing lead and then an audience growth strategist. Now, as you guys know, one of the cool things about podcasts is all the data that comes back, you know, the access to all the, you know, analytics and, and consumption information. So our audience growth lead is constantly analyzing that data, presenting it to our team internally, presenting it to the client, making, and so we can make decisions on future, you know, creative um, based on what the, the numbers are showing us. Um, and then we've got all the sort of behind the scenes uh, operations folk uh, who are um, keeping all of us, uh, uh, you know, coordinated and running. So you mentioned um, analytics and uh, there's some tools out there. Some are better than others. Uh, some come included with your host. Um, some, it's really hard to get actual numbers. Have you figured out the the secret mm-hmm. to that? No, no, we haven't. <laughs> it's uh, we're we're all living in a bit of a um, it's a bit of the wild west right now when it comes to all that information because of the privacy side of of what we do. Um, you know, uh, there's different aggregators that we use. so for 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 those that don't know that are listening. Most so our, our podcasts are host on a on a podcast uh, server. We'll use we we like to use Omni Studio, but we're not really we don't have a brand preference necessarily. Um, that's what allows us to push that podcast out to all the different directories using a, an an RSS feed. An RSS stands for real simple syndication. It just allows people to sort of subscribe to that uh, that um, that channel and then keep receiving new episodes when they're updated. So. We, we take that RSS feed, we give it to Apple Podcasts. Once it's on Apple Podcasts, it gets pushed out to 
a lot of the apps that the normal consumers will listen to a podcast on. I use one called Overcast. You might listen to one on you know, CastBox or, or things like that, but it's actually just pulling in the, the feed from Apple. But then it also gets distributed to Spotify. It also gets distributed to Google and Amazon, all that sort of stuff. Now, the, prop, the challenge is that those guys are all uh, taking data in, but they don't give out that data to the owners of those shows at the same sort of level of, of some have different privacy policies, some give us access to certain information, but others don't. And so we use an aggregator called Chartable. And Chartable is just purchased by Spotify. So by the time you listen to this episode, it might be called something different or it might actually be gone altogether. But um, Spotify just purchased them. And, and what Chartable does is it takes a lot of the data that's out there and aggregates it into sort of one dashboard that we can kind of pull from. But even then, it's not perfect. So we are very open with that with our clients. We tell them you know, when the, when the information is not complete, we make some educated guesses together. Um, and so we get a bit of a framework and general picture of sort of who our audience is, where they're coming from, and then what our download numbers look like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now I, I like think it. that's, you know, uh, again, I, I, this has become the theme of the show, but I appreciate the transparency because, uh, you know, obviously we, we struggle with the same problems you're describing and, uh, you know, on our end in terms of doing our own analytics. And so, uh, but I kind of appreciate that. Right. Cause I, again, back to the sort of idea of fake it till you make it or something I see a lot in agency, right. Is they sort of treat this stuff as fact, right. This is it. Like this is the data and maybe it is the data that you could get today or whatever, but the, I guess the willingness to be open and understand that it might not be the whole story I think is, is good. And communicating that to clients is great. Um, one of the things I wanted to dig in a little bit more on, and we touched on a little bit at the top was this idea of, you know, selling these things, you know, as a, as a package into a company, but I want to sort of pair it up with the idea of monetization and actually building a business around these podcasts. I think especially for young entrepreneurs or people who might just be starting a podcast on their own. I mean, most people have some sort of monetization in mind when they when they start building. You know, most are willing to forego for a little bit, but they sort of assume eventually this thing will make money. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, selling this thing into a business uh, and, you know, basically with, you know, because I mean, if you're being honest with them, you know, it's totally unknown how it'll go. Right. You might be able to hedge your bets a little bit, but I mean, you, you, it's not totally clear that it will be a wild success. Right. So how do we sell this thing into a business and letting them know that a, you know, or I guess establishing that doing podcasting is worth it as an experience. And then for the monetization aspect, you know, can we just talk about how the, um, yeah, or I guess sort of expectation setting, right? Like, I mean, around do all podcasts need to make money or can this simply be philanthropic and it's simply like a billboard on the side of the freeway, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm going to answer your question kind of in, in the opposite, the, the reverse order. So when it comes to monetization on the actual podcast themselves, uh, we recommend to our clients not to do that. Um, we, we don't put other brands ads within our podcast. And the reason for that is actually mostly for the, for the listener. Um, they understand that this, this podcast is coming from a brand. We're not, we don't hide that. Um, so it's a piece of branded content. Now, if we then inject advertising for, you know, underwears and, you know, underwear and, and mattresses and all that sort of stuff, which are all great, it feels like kind of double dipping a bit. And so we think just from a brand perspective, it's a bit harmful to do that. So we, 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 we tell them up front not to, and they agree with it. So then to the first question though, is how do you prove, or how do you show them sort of the ROI of, of the, of the podcast in a typical marketing answer? It depends. <laughs> it depends on the brand. It depends on what's important to them. So we talk about like top of funnel opportunities with podcasts, raising awareness. And then there's the sort of mid to, to lower end side of it, you know, where we're, we're dri you know, driving to some sort of conversion and, and purchase or whatnot. So again, every podcast is going to be different and they're going to see a different ROI depending on what it is we need to do. But like, okay. So, it, you know, we talked about, um, we talked about Expedia earlier. Um, for them, they came to us with a, a brand problem and, and, or a brand challenge, let's call it. Um, the brand challenge was that uh, we want to be known as a more helpful brand. How can the podcast do that for us? Or how can the podcast help us for that? So the podcast is all about sort of, you know, helping you navigate the online travel space, 
brought to you by Expedia. Well, we ran um, brand lift studies uh, throughout the you know throughout the season to determine um, what level their uh, audience saw them saw the brand as from a from a helpfulness sort of scale, and so to them that was an immediate sort of delivery of what it needed to do. Um, we've had other brands though where they want to see you know website traffic. And so we're able to track that. Uh, we're, we're able to actually track through some of the software that we use. We're able to track who is listening to the podcast. Did they end up on the website? We can't tell who the specific person is, but we can tell the IP address has made that sort of conversion. You know, if we wanted to, we haven't had clients take us up on it, but we can track it all the way through to a conversion, like a purchase or or you know a download of a form or or whatever. Most of them just want to see them, you know, kind of uh, want to receive more information about the brand or, or end up on the website in some way. Um, and then again, we, you know, we've had uh, clients that <laughs> sometimes the ROI, sometimes the sort of the goal for them is to just launch a podcast because that's something that they want to um, introduce into the organization as a communications challenge. I just conducted a, a two day workshop yesterday. I won't say the brand, but for them, their biggest sort of goal for this podcast is, is to just launch it. They don't care about how big the audience is. They don't care about, um, you know, some of those vanity metrics. They just want to be able to get it through the organization so that they can get something out there and then and then start to think about sort of growing the audience and, and, and things like that. So in classic, you know, uh, client service speak, it, it depends. <laughs> so yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, some people don't even realize that, uh, um, you know, like podcasts can be put together just as a, a form of communication between the company. They, they, it can be a private podcast for the employees only. Yeah, internal and podcast for sure. People don't even realize that that's a thing. Um, we did we did that for Lululemon, where it it only went to their global audience. It was only available to them. It was a leadership podcast, and uh, it was incredibly successful. What are your thoughts on video? Do you guys do, because mm-hmm. uh, we do a YouTube channel as well. This yep. podcast is actually going to be up there. Um, and for me, I was very hesitant to do that. Ryan was all about it. I don't, I don't like my face. I don't like anything to this right here. Just, uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me, it's like, uh, I see the value in it. I see, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's, We'll, we'll take clips of the podcast, chop it up and create little snippets, uh, quick hitters. And actually some of those quick hitters are our highest uh, play counts based off mm-hmm. of, you know, what we've done with them. So it yeah, does so serve a purpose. For sure. I, I don't personally like it myself. <laughs> and I don't personally like it either, to be honest. We were totally against it when we first la- launched the company. Um, I think the biggest thing was like, why? Well, and we say this to this day to clients, like, why, why do you want video? Because 99.9% of like podcast video is just recording as like a zoom call, like, and, and who wants to watch a zoom call. That being said, what we have noticed is it's great for SEO because uh, typically you'll see it at the top of, of Google um, because of the, you know, the Google YouTube connection. Um, and then, and then the reality is like a lot of the younger audience, the, 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 the Gen Z, the, the um, uh, Gen Y are listening to podcasts on YouTube. A lot of it is because with the new sort of YouTube premium, you can play it in the background without, you know, kind of losing, uh, losing this, you know, losing the, the, the feed. Um, but also they're just on YouTube so much that, that they will listen to the full episode right then and there. And so because of that, we are, we're all in on it. We're not doing it at the level of like, um, you know, big, big sort of film production. It's pretty straightforward and simple. We'll do um, the clips like you mentioned as well. And we, you know, we see that performance, but um, it's not really like, I, I, I have a hard time seeing the value in, in, in it, but it's sort of a, a necessary evil. <laughs> That's not that it's evil. It's just a necessary, it's kind of table stakes now. Well, and yeah, I'll, I, I'll mention, you know, cause I'm like Mike, like I don't like seeing my face or any of that stuff on TV either. <laughs> and so, so I'm with him on that front, 
But for me, it was always like a matter of, an, it was like an efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, we were doing a lot of phone calls by Zoom. And so to your point, yeah, we were just republishing a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And so, but it was like, I don't know, we already have it. Like, why not? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, over the yeah. years, we've, we've tried to up our, our level of production and we do a little better job, you know, our, our you guys look great. a little better and all that kind of stuff these days. You look great. Well, but, you should have um, seen me three weeks ago. <laughs> I, I, you have, cl you have clothes on, which is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, a way. Plus, not wearing any you pants. haven't seen it if I have pants on. That's the other <laughs> Well, that's that's part of the mystery, right? <laughs> we don't let him stand up during the show. No reason. <laughs> we don't let him. So, but uh, but anyway, so my point is that we we've definitely leveled up our production a little bit and put a little more value on it. But it began life as just an efficiency, right? And so to your point though, about you know, maybe grander level production and things like that. I think some people do that. There's a, a guy that I watch called Tom Bilyeu that does a lot of these like self-help and motivational shows and stuff. And he has a podcast, but he also does, you know, basically full on production in a studio with lights and cameras and all that kind of stuff. Right. Totally. And so if you can, and that's going to be your channel, then, okay, that makes a lot of sense, you know, but for podcasting specifically, like for me, like I said, it was just a, just an efficiency or an add on. Yeah. And, and again, um, I, we always go back to the listener. We always go back to the, or in this case, the viewer, it's sort of the why and what level of value are we delivering to them? If it's, if, if, you know, if, if the data tells you that, you know, your audience is listening on YouTube, then be on YouTube. If it's not, then I, I don't see why it's an absolute must. Um, it, 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 it kind of, it, 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 again, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's right. So here in the last 10 or so minutes, I wanted to maybe focus a little bit more on the type of content people are creating. And, and we, again, touched on this a little bit at the very beginning, but I want to talk about maybe in a more grand discussion or a broader discussion, you know, about generating quality content. And, you know, if you've come across in your experience, like storytelling secrets or things that people ought to know, right? And, uh, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, in a lot of podcasts, especially, you know, even if they're interview based, you mentioned this idea of sort of a story arc and things like that over the course of a season. And so I think it's really important to focus on the storytelling because that's kind of the whole thing. And, you know, again, back to the Amex stuff or, or you know, other examples, I wish I, I had more familiarity or knew more of the shows. But um, but in the case of that, you know, it's the story is something related, but it's not them, you know, so I, I think you've talked about that a little bit, but I wonder if you talk about just sort of the secrets behind good storytelling and how people can, you know, find a successful podcast. Yeah. So uh, again, it comes down to the, it get, comes down to the listener and um, what sort of value you're delivering to them, but th there's different ways and formats you can, you can deliver that. It can be sort of done in like a, a sort of a panel style where you're getting a bunch of opposing views and you're having more of a conversation about a topic. You can do uh, sort of one-to-one -one sort of style like this. I know there's two of you, but you know, this is kind of a, a one-to-one -one style, you know, interview. We like to incorporate a number of different styles into the, into an episode. So we can do everything, you know, we'll do everything from streeters where we're starting an episode off with sort of the public's perception or point of view on a topic. And then that's kind of an injection into, into the conversation. Um, we're now uh, giving a lot of our guests um, an opportunity to kind of like, we call them sort of mobile diaries or audio diaries where they're kind of going about their day and recording a little bit of sound. So we're folding that in the conversation, you know, kind of there, there's no real rules to how you, you do this, but there are ways of injecting some variety into an episode. And the reason we do that is to keep the listener's literal brain engaged. If we can kind of, you know, in a non-awkward sort of way, if we can incorporate different sounds, different tones, different um, what we call texture into an episode, it uh, literally keeps the brain engaged and refresh and, and fresh. And, and for a branded podcast, we, you know, this is a content medium that's key for a brand. So actually, going back to the sort of the beginning of the conversation about like audience size and setting expectations and all that sort of stuff. We actually try to like not have too much of a conversation about audience size. We talk about the quality of that audience. Uh, we talk about hitting the right people for as long as possible. And so for us, our key metric is always that engagement rate or that listen through rate. And so for us, we're trying to get the listener, you know, listening in the first place or the right listener listening in the first place and then listening for as long as possible. And as you guys know, you can tell in the data where they're dropping off, where they're skipping, where there isn't any interest. And we're using that, uh, you know, to kind of factor into further episodes. So, uh, you know, 
tons of different ways of telling a story, but we, we, we like to incorporate as many of those different ways into an episode, which takes planning and, and, and time and, and a bit of a roadmap for how the episode's going to be, you know, constructed before we even go out there and do it. Um, but then also taking the real live audio and accepting that that's what we've recorded. You know, we, we, we very rarely sort of script exactly what somebody's going to say. Um, we we leave it up to the to the host, and we try to have those authentic conversations, and then you know kind of build a, build the episode uh, that way. Yeah, no, I think that's great, and I think again, you know, I mean the the two things that you really that you mentioned in there that I really like, you know, first of all is just this focus on the audience. I mean, for people listening to this show or people starting a podcast or running a business, whatever, like, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? I mean, it really is like whether you're selling a product or putting together a podcast, I mean, you got to know who you're talking to and, and, and why, you know, why they even want what you're selling. Sure. So, uh, sure. so I think that that's absolutely critical. The other thing I think that you touched on, and I've heard you say in other interviews and stuff, but, it, and we've talked about podcasting this way too, is that it is the wild west. And it's mm-hmm. actually, you know, it sort of unfairly gets compared to radio a lot because I think it's the the next nearest thing, you know, maybe kissing cousin, but, and also, it, and also a lot of the, a lot of the talent that is in podcasting today came from radio. Yeah. Makes sense. Right. And yeah. same with the ad guys and the sales guys and all that stuff mm-hmm. that came from that infrastructure, but it really is wild west. And you do mm-hmm. have the latitude to plan an episode and behave the way that you want, or talk the way you want about a certain thing or use, you know, to use your word, you know, to apply texture as necessary and, and these sorts of things that, you know, maybe in like a live radio broadcast, you don't really have, right. You have a host talking into a microphone and then, you know, talking up the next song or whatever, but you might yeah. lose some of these production qualities that you can have as just part of a podcast. It's not live. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I think that that's uh, that's pretty incredible. And I think that, you know, just being able to sort of talk about podcasting in that way, you know, again, and <laughs> it's so funny because, you know, so this will be our 250 something interview with a CEO wow. or a founder. And, you know, the the commonalities or the truths that emerge are the same for everybody, right? It, it's always this, you know, by by the, the, you know, you're kind of always on the edge of your seat. You never really know. Nobody actually knows the answer. Everything is Wild West. And I think it's kind of beautiful that we've been able to have this conversation and really sort of expose that because I think, the insecurities or the things that keep people from starting a podcast or beginning a show or starting a business or, you know, whatever it is they want to do, those insecurities are these things, right? They're the things we're right. talking about. They, they believe they're not good enough. They believe they're not smart enough. They believe they don't have it figured out well enough, you know, whatever it is. And all those things are triggers that keep people from firing. And uh, so I think it's really great that we've been able to have that conversation here. Yeah, I've, I've absolutely loved it. It's been bothering me though, in the back of my mind, I realized that I went off on a big diatribe about uh, the book, The War of Art. I was calling it The War on Art. It is The War of Art. <laughs> <laughs> and that I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight if I didn't get that corrected. Yeah, no. And actually I'm a huge advocate for that book and other books by Stephen <laughs> Pressfield. He's got a bunch of, of, I mean, they're pretty easy to read, straightforward yeah. books, but they are- and he does uh, a, He does a good audio book as well. Yeah, they're super valuable. And I think he does his own recording for the audiobook. Which is he does. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. So here in the last couple of minutes, I just wondered if we could get a little bit of, you know, information, where can people track you down if they want to engage with you? How can they work with Jar Audio if they'd like to? And, uh, you know, any parting shots? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, check check us out, uh, jaraudio.com. Uh, we're open to having conversations with any and all brands about the pod, about getting them into the podcast space. Um, we, we like to just help as much as possible as well. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, check us out on LinkedIn as well. Uh, so Jar Audio on LinkedIn. Also, you know, add myself. Uh, so Roger Nairn on LinkedIn. I'm also on, on Twitter as well, but that's usually where I do most of my kind of uh, uh, complaining about having a toddler and getting into politi- <laughs> getting into political arguments and stuff like that, but I am there. Um, yeah, and as far as parting shots, I honestly I have nothing. It's an incredibly exciting time to be in the podcast space, but also to get your your brand and organization into the podcast space. Um, it's an incredibly engaging medium that has uh, potential. Uh, endless potential for, for, for brands. It's also an incredibly friendly space as well. You know, any vendor you're going to speak to any sales rep, t- tech guy, uh, creator are just like super jazzed and excited about telling awesome stories. And we want to see more brands get into it. So t- you know, don't hesitate to reach out. It's uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and the people are amazing. 
Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, I think Mike and I both would agree. We've had a, other, you know, podcast producers and stuff on the show and everybody is super cool. It's a great yeah. community and, and it's it's funny how small it is, right? I mean, it's sort of like being, I don't know, in the early days of something cool, you know, and totally. so it's, it's fun to be meeting people uh, in the space at this time. So that, And it's, a, so it's, it's bringing together a lot of people from a lot of different worlds um, and and we're all creating it using our own experiences. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, thanks so much, uh, Roger, for doing this show. I mean, I've, I, I, I've had a lot of fun. I mean, I probably talked too much, but, but, uh, but you, I probably really talked too much. The conversation. <laughs> this has been awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, and thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you.